You're live. Hello, fellow listeners. Welcome to another edition of Socialist Action Webcast. My name is Elizabeth Weiss, and I'm the Federal Treasurer of Socialist Action and a member of the NDP Socialist Caucus Steering Committee. We acknowledge that this event is taking place on Indigenous lands across Turtle Island, known as North America. That includes the unceded territories of the Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Wendat, and Audenoshawnee people, in a place called Toronto. We join in the fight for justice, recognizing that there can be no real reconciliation without restitution. That entails seizing the assets of the big resource corporations and returning them to the commons. Tonight's topic is no COVID evictions with Rob McBean of Socialist Action and ACORN plus Mariana Lewicki, East York ACORN, founding member of Capret. Tenants Union, Eurydice Baumgarten, Tenants Workers, Federation of Metro Tenants Association, and Kerry Vadivelu of Scarborough Acorn, and a founder of Omsky Tenants Union. Rob will speak for about 15 minutes, and each of the other panelists will speak up to 10. After that, we will take questions written into the chat column from the online audience. So, let's begin. Rob McBean is a member of Socialist Action and ACORN. He was the campaign manager for the Socialist Action Ward 22 municipal election campaign in January 2021. He is a former voter contact organizer for the Toronto Centre New Democrats. So welcome, Rob. Thank you so much for the introduction, Elizabeth. It's a real pleasure to be back. I had so much fun doing one of these last year. Um, now, this situation that we're in with the COVID and evictions is something that we have to take seriously uh, if we're going to avoid an epidemic of homelessness in the coming months. Uh, according to Parkdale Organize, almost 25,000 landlord and tenant board hearings have taken place since the pandemic started. Uh, there's no way to know how many of those resulted in eviction orders since the board is not releasing data about the outcomes. Uh, despite the possibility of thousands or potentially even more than 10,000 eviction orders hiding there on the books, uh, my outlook is actually a bit optimistic and I'll explain why. Uh, but before I get into that, I just want to remind everyone that this mass, eviction, this mass eviction situation has happened before. That We've been through this already and the lessons are there in history for us to learn. So before we, we look at today's situation, I just want to look back to where we've already been. Uh, the classical example of economic crisis and mass eviction comes from the Great Depression years uh, in New York City, specifically the Bronx. Uh, the years were 1932 and 33. Uh, the shock of the 1929 stock market crash was over, but the grinding unemployment was still affecting not just working class people, but middle class professionals too. These conditions of generalized poverty set off monumental rent strikes. Those rent strikes in turn set off mass eviction attempts by New York landlords coupled with heavy state repression. Uh, the first big wave of rent strikes were set off by unemployed middle-class tenants, uh, many who had activist and communist backgrounds. Uh, a lot of them had joined something called the Upper Bronx Unemployed Council, which had been set up by the Communist Party. Uh, their next step was to form tenant committees. Uh, three big buildings in the Bronx uh, got most of their tenants to go out on rent strike. Uh, the demands of the rent strike were just like the ones we have today. Lower rent, better maintenance, no evictions. People started picketing the buildings and rent was withheld. Uh, the landlords moved as quickly as possible to use the state to violently break the strikes and impose mass evictions. On their first try, uh, the tenants physically fought off a police assault and they won a rent reduction for the building that was on strike. So the landlords tried again. On their second try, uh, they did get a tiny little handful of evictions, like less than five, but the cost that they had to pay to get those evictions was just too high. They had to pay for 50 cops, some on horseback, and an expensive private scab crew of movers uh, to move furniture out onto the street. And these rent strikes kept getting bigger. Uh, tenant demonstrations of 4,000 people were not uncommon. 
Rent reductions were happening all across New York City and the landlords were scared. Uh, now, landlords were able to get evictions here and there, but the rent strike movement could not be suppressed. It became like an epidemic. Uh, when a strike broke out in one apartment house, strikes would start in nearby apartment houses. Uh, landlords would be forced to capitulate to the demands of tenants and rents were reduced over and over and over. Uh, this epidemic got to the point where the business model of being a landlord in the Bronx was getting to the point where it was actually a money losing business. Now, as, as if you're a tenant, that might sound good from your perspective, uh, but there were some downsides. Uh, some tactical errors were made by the Communist Party leaders of this strike movement. Uh, the communists were so doggedly focused on recruiting to the unemployed councils that they controlled and to the Communist Party itself that they forgot to actually have a real strategy to end the housing crisis. Uh, the party failed to put forth a comprehensive analysis of the problems that tenants were facing, and they didn't offer a programmatic solution to the huge housing crisis of the Great Depression. Um, in any sort of negotiation with landlords, uh, the communist strike leaders took a very hard line. Uh, their position was, you made lots of profit when times were good. Now that times are hard, you can suffer. Um, it was more or less a refusal to negotiate. Uh, now, this is, of course, justifiable uh, from a principled position, but it was not the right call for the situation. Uh, the communists' hard line pretty much forced, uh, pretty much forced a street-level civil <coughs> class war. Uh, the landlords circled their wagons and they used their usual tools, which is lawyers, lobbyists, favors from judges, cop harassment and intimidation, corporate media, so on. But then they went beyond this, uh, and they acted in the interest of their own social class in a more coordinated and brutal way than what is usually seen. Uh, the landlords set up strike funds to bail out their class brothers who were unable to pay their mortgages due to these rent strikes. Uh, they got a new law passed uh, bringing so-called criminal conspiracy charges against strike leaders. They criminalized picketing in front of apartment buildings, and they used their cops to enforce these new laws. So by the beginning of 1933, uh, picketing apartment buildings was now a crime. Uh, the cops enthusiastically enforced the new law, and now rent striking had become dangerous uh, and really, really hard. Uh, what the landlords got for their efforts was a huge number of eviction orders. Uh, they were called dispossessed notices at the time, and they got them quite quickly. They were able to carry out quite a few of the eviction orders. So while the landlords succeeded in kind of getting the heat off of themselves, their heavy handed approach uh, had actually not solved the underlying pro problem that people couldn't afford to pay rent. Uh, now, for their part, uh, the communist strike leaders, uh, they were unable to sustain the hard class war that they so desperately wanted. So they changed their tactics. Uh, the unemployed councils uh, began to direct their energy towards the Home Relief Bureau. Uh, this was the precursor to the welfare state, which was being built at the time. Uh, peaceful sit-in strikes at the Relief Bureau were staged, uh, where you would see dozens or hundreds of families uh, who were facing eviction. And it worked. Uh, rent checks were written up and given out by the thousands. Uh, the mass evictions were averted. So it seemed that peaceful, gradual reformism had won the day. Uh, but what we should not forget is that if it were not for the revolutionary acts of the communist strike leaders, no reforms would ever have come. So now let's spin the clock forward and look at our time and our place here in Toronto. Where were we just before this pandemic hit? Well, during the height of the housing crisis, uh, the landlords were relying on loopholes like rent evictions or own use evictions to jack the rents. Uh, landlords, if they were caught doing this, they would only get small fines and the onus was always on the tenant to prove they were evicted in bad faith. Um, and there was fight back, organized fight back. Uh, Parkdale organized helped some successful rent strikes, which I described in detail last year in a video called Keep Your Rent. Uh, the FMTA, ACORN, and other groups were advocating for 
vacancy control, which means that the landlord can't just jack the rent every time a new tenant moves in. Uh, OCAP was drawing up grand plans for expropriation and development of derelict downtown east side properties. Uh, they would have had them turned into large scale affordable housing structures. And this was all great activism, but despite all the activism, the rents just kept going up. It just seemed like there was no hope. But then the COVID apocalypse changed all that. Immediately, in the middle of March 2020, evictions were banned. Uh, early on, uh, the landlords did get a little sh shock uh, in April of 2020 when they lost a good chunk of their rental income. Uh, and it kind of caused a little scandal at the end of April in inside a giant cluster of rental apartments around Victoria Park subway station. Uh, agents of the landlords uh, were caught going door to door with Interact machines, uh, demanding immediate rent payment uh, by credit or debit card. Uh, but this situation stabilized quite quickly uh, with the introduction of the CERB relief payment. But still, some people were withholding their rent, uh, sometimes because they had to, and some just because they wanted to. Now, the property-owning class was not about to just sulk away and let the, all their rental profits disappear. So in the middle of the first wave of COVID, uh, they got the Conservative government to pass Bill 184. Uh, Bill 184 has an Orwellian name. It's called the Protecting Tenants and Strengthening Community Housing Act. It's Orwellian because what it actually is, is the eviction bill. Uh, having been passed, it now applies retroactively to day one of the pandemic. What does Bill 184 do? Well, uh, for starters, uh, landlord tenant board mediators have been eliminated in favor of repayment agreements negotiated directly between landlord and tenant. Once a tenant enters into a repayment agreement, if they're one day late or $1 short, the landlord can apply for a fast eviction without having to go through a hearing at the board. Bill 184 also permits the board to grant evictions if the tenant rejects a payment plan. So this could allow landlords to force tenants out by simply offering them an unreasonable payment plan and then saying the tenant's refusal of the plan is grounds for eviction. So there's no doubt that Bill 184 exists to open the door to mass evictions. But the mere existence of this bill is not necessarily the doomsday scenario. Everything is going to be decided on the city blocks and in the apartment buildings themselves. And there are good signs that tenants are not going into this fight weak and unprepared. Uh, towards the end of the first wave, uh, we started to see large anti-eviction demonstrations with hundreds of, hundreds of people directed towards Toronto Mayor John Tory. Uh, predictably, he tried to pass the buck saying it's a provincial matter uh, in the strictest sense that may be technically a little bit true, uh, but in every real sense, it is completely not true. Uh, John Tory does not have a free pass on the eviction issue. After all, it is his cops that will be called if the provincial sheriffs are not able to fulfill eviction orders. If Tory cared about Toronto tenants, he would openly state that the city opposes any and all COVID-related evictions bar none. Full stop. Uh, now, a month after the first wave eviction ban was lifted, we got some tests of just how these things might be playing out. Uh, on September the 21st, 2020, in that giant rental cluster at Victoria Park Station, uh, 108 Goodwood Park to be exact, 14 cops showed up to try and evict one single unit, but they ran straight into a People's Defense Toronto community blockade. The cops turned around and left. There was no eviction that day. Uh, there were setbacks too. Uh, about a week or so after that, the cops... Uh, came in through the door unannounced of a Crescent Town unit, arrested three people, and did carry an out, out an eviction at 1.30 in the morning. The People's Defense Toronto Community Watch had gone home that day because it was 1.30 in the morning. Now, this is secret police type stuff. I don't think we're going to see too much of this sort of Gestapo type stuff going forward. Uh, it's just so expensive for the landlords to be doing that because it very clearly demonstrates to everyone just how hostile these landlords and their cops really are. Uh, to me, it seems that the landlords actually have some idea of just how hard it would be to do mass evictions and the fact that it's actually unprofitable. Uh, homeless people don't pay rent after all. There are even some isolated cases of landlord groups uh, joining with low-income groups to ask for government-funded relief uh, for tenants who are falling behind. 
Now, I, I just want to note that the president of the Federation of Rental Housing Providers, which is a landlord group in the first wave, uh, he stated that he absolutely did not want to see mass evictions. And he appeared to be genuine in that statement. Uh, and after the first wave, uh, we started to see condos emptying out, uh, especially downtown. And now incentives were being offered by landlords to get new tenants. Uh, first month free, $500 move-in bonus, free parking. This was the first renter's market in Toronto in 11 years. Now, when this, we're in an eviction ban right now. And when this ban ends, I personally don't think we're going to see tens of thousands of instant evictions and homeless clogging the parks and streets. Even though I am optimistic on that front, there are undeniably some people who are at very high risk of eviction when evictions start. So how do you get evicted after COVID? Uh, there are three characteristics that the people who are going to get uh, evicted have. One, they lost income due to COVID and fell behind. Two, they're bad at computers and the internet and they have a hard time with the online hearings. And three, uh, they're probably maybe not the best neighbors and won't get the, symp the sympathy from the tenants and people around them. So anyone who has all three of these things uh, going against them is almost guaranteed to be evicted post COVID. Uh, and we started to see this after the wave one ban ended. Uh, people with personal issues and a hard time with technical stuff were just so disadvantaged. Uh, I'm just going to recount a horror story from the new world of landlord tenant board eviction hearings. Uh, this is from the Lawyers Daily. Um, a man with a history of homelessness and mental health issues was facing eviction. Without a landline or a cell phone, he was forced to call into the hearing room from an outdoor payphone. Expecting to be evicted, he refused tenant duty counsel's help, duty counsel's just free lawyers, uh, and asked if he could just go straight to jail instead. Now, as the landlord testified, the tenant spoke up to comments, and he was told by the landlord tenant board member, they call the judges members, to be quiet. His turn would be coming. Uh, and this happened many times. The man was getting more and more agitated. He didn't seem to understand the process. He was very nervous. Uh, the lawyer who uh, the duty counsel said, the man said that it was raining. It was starting to rain hard. He was cold. And I realized that an odd noise I could hear during the hearing was him shivering through most of the process. After 15 or 20 minutes, the tenant cried out, I'm freezing. It's raining. I can't do this. And he hung up. Tenant duty counsel has heard at least one landlord member admit that they're, quote, doing a blitz of evictions. Uh, in order to clear the mammoth backlog of rent arrears eviction cases, uh, new members are getting appointed to work nine to 12 months instead of the usual two or three year terms. Uh, this is the legal equivalent of hiring temp agency employees to speed up production on an assembly line except in this case, the product is evictions. The situation we're in today is very fluid. Uh, our right-wing provincial government is doing everything in their power to set the stage for mass evictions, but whether or not they actually happen is another matter. Uh, the, the decision facing us as activists is, how much resources are we going to devote to the cause of protecting the most vulnerable? Uh, do bad neighbors who fell behind on their rent and don't know how to use the internet, do they deserve to be put out onto the street? Well, the answer to that question is obviously no. But the hard question we're going to have to answer is how much of ourselves are we going to give to protect them from a coordinated landlord assault? Thank you. Thank, thank you, Rob. A little bit there. thank you yes i i i realize i'm on thank you rob thank you so much so our next speaker is mary anna lewicki and she is a tenant advocate who is an acorn member and a former member of the board of directors of the federation of metro tennis association she has been active in challenging above guidelines increase applications and her comments about agis appeared in a recent cbc story in 2017, she helped gain media coverage that pressured Caprite to rescind the seasonal air conditioning it had tried to impose on Park Vista tennis. Welcome, Mariana. Uh, thanks, Elizabeth, for that great introduction. And it's, uh, you know, following Rob is a hard act, but I will uh, try to just 
keep the momentum going. So yes, my name is Mariana Lewecki, and I've been an ACORN member since August 2015. Uh, for those who don't know, ACORN Canada is a multi-issue community union of low and moderate income people. ACORN believes that social and economic justice can best be achieved by building community power for change. ACORN has over 140,000 members organized into 24 neighborhood chapters in nine cities across Canada. And since 2004, ACORN has won several important victories, including payday lending legislation, raises in the minimum wage, housing rights bylaws across the country, affordable internet program, disability rights, and much more. So I'll start my remarks with by asking a rhetorical question. If someone was drowning, would you throw them a lifesaver or an anchor? Because of recent changes to the eviction process, and Rob's gone over some of those, renters now risk being plunged into homelessness or staying afloat depending on their legal savvy, their ability to navigate bureaucracy, their bank balance, and the benevolence of landlords. In the midst of an unprecedented crisis in our lifetime, the government introduced eviction reforms in 2020 that amount to an express lane for the exploitation of vulnerable tenants. The previous eviction process included a key mandatory safeguard, a landlord and tenant board hearing process, which allowed tenants to have access to duty counsel and a mediator. The changes introduced last year allowed landlords and tenants to reach side deals outside of the landlord and tenant board process. The onus rests on each side to best protect their own interests, which often don't align. The landlord wants as much rent as soon as possible and can often boost the existing rent significantly if a unit becomes vacant. A tenant behind in the rent needs a place to live but may be struggling with job loss, reduced hours or reduction in household income. They want flexibility, more time to pay and to stay in their unit. Under the previous system, the LTB process helped the two sides reach a fair deal. Eliminating the mandatory LTB hearing as a first step has removed an important referee from the initial process, leaving both sides to defend their interests on their own. Now that would work if the playing field were level, but it's not. To mix metaphors, in some cases, it would be like pitting Muhammad Ali in his prime against someone who had never stepped into a boxing ring. My landlord, Cap Bree, had operating revenue of more than 883 million in 2020, and net operating income of more than 578 million. Now that's up 13.8% from 2019, despite COVID. Capreet's net operating income margin was 75.2%. So about one third of the revenue went to operating expenses, the rest was profit. As I hope you can appreciate, an entity with more than 883 million in annual revenue has a bit more flexibility to cover legal advice and expenses than the average tenant struggling to pay their rent. Given the tight rental market in Toronto, tenants are often at the mercy of landlords. While there are certainly some small landlords who are struggling to cover bills, there are also large landlords churning out massive profits and always looking for more ways to further boost the bottom line. Bill 184 adds more tools to their already hefty toolbox. The changes to the eviction process are a gift to landlords and are proving disastrous to the most vulnerable tenants, especially those whose lives have been severely disrupted by COVID-19. Now, prior to his redemption in the movie, A Christmas Carol, the fictional character Ebenezer Scrooge brushes off a request for a holiday donation to the poor with the callous words, are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? Well, we have prisons. We don't have workhouses. People seeking affordable housing in Toronto can face a 10 year wait. Prior to the COVID crisis, there was already an affordability crisis with nearly a quarter of renters in Toronto spending more than 50% of their household income on rent and utilities and 40% of households spending more than 30% of their income on rent and utilities. The shelter system is strained and conditions can be so challenging that some people would prefer to pitch a tent in the park, live under an expressway or sleep in the doorways of businesses or under bridges. 
walk down Bay Street and you may see a Ferrari roar by a person sleeping in a bus shelter. It's wildly optimistic to expect people to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps if they can't afford boots. In a March 20, 2020 Toronto Star news story, Premier Doug Ford was quoted as saying, no one should be able to be kicked out of their home or their rental apartments based on not being able to pay the rent. That's just not going to happen. We won't allow it to happen. We have to make sure that we take care of the people. However, it seems the people who got taken care of were landlords seeking to speed up the eviction process. Now Gone in 60 Seconds isn't just the title of a car heist action film. It's a scene that sometimes unfolds at the landlord and tenant board. Although eviction protections have been weakened, it hasn't diminished our resolve to fight back. We recognize collective action is even more important. We need to work together so that people at risk of eviction have ac access to expert help and support. The power of ACORN was instrumental in winning a six-year repayment plan for Kiri and as well with his landlord, Ed, which you'll hear from Kiri later. Um, this is in stark contrast to the draconian Bill 184 rules, where tenants being one day late can be evicted without a hearing. We need to continue to pursue our efforts to raise awareness of the impact of evictions, whether it's naming and shaming bad landlords online or in news stories, creating broader alliances, signing petitions, holding protests, organized lobbying, or personal outreach to politicians. The crisis of COVID has created challenges for tenants, but it has also unleashed a powerful wave of mobilization and organized resistance. From rent strikes to human chains to try to block enforcement of eviction orders to tenant-led food banks to online maps of eviction and rent eviction data and scathing reports on above guideline rent increases and the negative impact of real estate investment trusts. When greed tries to triumph over basic need, we can't let landlords become our overlords. When the interests of cash clash with compassion, we cannot be silent. Stand up, speak out, and fight back. Stay strong and keep pushing for social justice. Thanks for the opportunity to talk to you today. Thank you, Mariana. Our next panelist is Eurydice Baumgarten. She's a tenant organizer with the Federation of Metro Tenants Association from January 2012 to the present. She's an immigrant from Brazil, translates English to Portuguese, and is an accomplished photographer. She studied at the University of Toronto and has worked in Toronto to foster the creation of tenant associations and to support them. Welcome, Eurydice. Thanks, Elizabeth. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, so I have a few remarks, um, starting with COVID. Uh, you know, when this whole COVID thing started a, a little bit more than a year ago, there were, especially in social media, but people talking around, there was a lot of uh, optimistic ideas People somehow thought that uh, this virus had come to clean the world, uh, the earth is healing, the animals are in the fields, <laughs> global warming will slow down, life will get better. Well, um, that's uh, nice to think like that, but um, this didn't really happen uh, because we live in, in a capitalist society. And in a society like that, uh, wherever there is chaos, somebody is taking the opportunity to take advantage of this chaos. With COVID, a lot of uh, uh, disorganizing of the, the world got disorganized and started getting reorganized. And um, in, in that uh, reorganization, the poor got much poorer and the rich got really, really really rich. So uh, delivery companies, uh, online sales, Amazon, Costco, all those guys, they got very rich. And many of people, many people that uh, uh, 
we know that uh, lived in a small home somewhere or had a, a little apartment are now uh, being evicted in the park by the police uh, all over Toronto. Toronto is a city now full of tents and, uh, and the police keeps coming and evicting these people uh, and being supported by part of the population that doesn't really see that uh, people that are being kicked from Rosedale will move to Forest Hill, will move to the Don River, will move downtown again. And so at the same time, while well, part of the middle class people like me gets to work and keep receiving their salary, lots of the poor are forced to keep working in factories, supermarkets, or just unemployed and having to take the hard decision between put food on the table uh, for the families are paying rent. In all of this, I am a tenant organizer. I work, uh, my work before the, the pandemic and after is organizing people in tenant associations. And before I get right into there, I wanna tell you two tenant stories that I got uh, the last yesterday and today. In one of them, an MPP office reached out to me. They are trying to help a tenant that has been locked out of their apartment by their landlord. Uh, well, they found out what uh, I have known for 10 years. There is very little they can do once a person has been locked out uh, because the system is completely set against us. They call the police on behalf of this tenant. The police will want to do anything. Then they called the rental housing enforcement unit. That is supposedly the, the tenants, um, the tenants police. They they should the landlord tenant police. Those guys should call the landlord and tell them to let the tenant back in. Well, this amazing unit uh, consists of two people for the province of Ontario. <laughs> two guys on the telephone for the province of the province of Ontario. Those guys are supposed to find landlords and make them follow the law. Uh, of course, they said it's going to take a long time. So this tenant has to make another other arrangements, or he has somebody he can crash uh, with, or he's in the street in the park being evicted by the police. So that is one story. This MPP will keep trying to help. But, you know, until the, it can take many months until it is solved. Uh, I got uh, yesterday the case of a tenant that uh, received uh, some bogus um, verbal notices from the landlord. And uh, the landlord said, oh, my kids are going to move in your apartment. Didn't give her any letter, anything. And then after that, the landlord said, oh, we need you to, to, to write us a letter saying that you agree to move out. Well, no, of course I told her she doesn't have to do that, but so many people go through those tricks. So many people go through those tricks and so many people fall for these tricks. So what I want to tell you about tenants is this. Not, not all tenants are made the same. Some tenants want to fight. A, a huge proportion of them just want to live their lives. So many people that call me want individual solutions. They think, uh, uh, they think that they can, they can get a solution for themselves. They think that uh, they can talk to the higher ups in the corporation they rent to. And you know, it, that doesn't help because in fact, the solution is in our hands. Uh, and the, the solution is for us as tenants, with each other to educate each other, build community. And uh, I, I don't know, I can't really see my time here because there's, um, there's a, something in front of my, um, okay, I can see it now. Um, okay, <laughs> it's impossible. Uh, but uh, the solution is we work, we work with each other, we create, organisms, tenants, associations, and we educate ourselves. Education is key. If you know, 
If you know what you should do, if you know what the law says, if you know what you have at your hands, you have much. Even if the system is rigged against you, when you have knowledge, you have a lot. The other thing is you build community. You live on a building, you get, you get to know your neighbors, you work with them, you work with your neighbors on your building, on, your, on the building on your side, in your neighborhood. And that gives you power. There is power in numbers. A tenant association in this sense is like a union. More people, more power, more ability you have to do things. And then you organize. And when you organize, what do you do? If you are a tenant, you consider organizing with your neighbors. You consider create your tenant association creating a, a resident association in your neighborhood, creating a tenant network uh, from the same landlord. You create something bigger than yourself because that's what you need. You, you can't do it just with you in a world that is made to make you small. Uh, if you're an activist, you should consider helping people to organize based on educating, like get really teaching people what they need to know about, about being a tenant, about fighting as a tenant. Uh, and you know, FMTA can help, ACORN can help. There are other, other institutions that, not institutions, other groups that can help. Uh, and you push, you push both by, is the institutional way, your MPP, your city councilor, your city, depart city departments, your legal clinics, and also you push by going out, protesting, going with ACORN, going with other groups, going out and like really uh, making a show outside of what you need, calling the press. Uh, you know, if we are quiet, nobody sees us. If we suffer in silence, we are nobody. So it is really important that we all get together and, and do what we need. And I say that as a tenant organizer, of course, we have to see ourselves in the big picture. We live in a capitalist society. Personally, as Eurydice, not, I'm not talking as the tenant organizer, I think we have to change this capitalist society for something else. But as a tenant organizer, I say, you start getting organized with your neighbors, with your friends, and you change something. That's it. Elizabeth, you're muted. Sorry, guys, I'm warning you, and I'm the one that's, that's forgetting to, uh, to unmute myself. Okay, so our next panelist is Kerry uh, Vadivelu and his family faced eviction during the stay-at-home emergency order. In response, he founded the Omsky Tenants Union. Union. In collaboration with ACORN and Socialist Action, Kerry ensured his neighbors received resources to avoid eviction during the pandemic. Kerry completed stewardship training with the United Steel Workers. At age 15, he immigrated from Sri Lanka, escaping a genocide that consumed millions of innocent Tamils. Kerry is married and is the proud father of a three-year-old baby daughter, Catherine. So congratulations to all three, mom, dad, and Catherine. Welcome, Kerry. Oh, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, that was then a uh, fantastic introduction. Um, so uh, it, to share my, my site, uh, I think my colleagues uh, from FMTA um, and uh, um, Social Action and uh, ACON have done a really good job on explaining the theories and the principles and the current struggles. Um, I will focus more on the on the tenant uh, on the tenant issues in my building uh, with some stats and then my story of uh, how I. Uh, rescued myself from an uh, eviction that I thought uh, I would never be able to challenge or overcome. Um, so uh, at, at my, build, my building is uh, lo located at uh, uh, located in Scarborough, south of Scarborough. 
um, middle and neck line time. Uh, predominantly it's low income neighborhood, uh, recent immigrants, visible minority with uh, children and families. Uh, it is a private building uh, with the uh, market rate being tenants, surrounded by community housing, uh, community housing buildings. Most eligible applied and still waiting for housings after many years. 70% uh, of the tenants lived five years or more in, the, in, in my building. Um, it just goes to show that affordable housing is only on the paper, but it's not in reality. In reality, people are waiting for 10 years to get one. Um, so this is a 40 story, 14 story building uh, managed by Homescar Properties and it's built in 1970s. Uh, since changed uh, ownership uh, for about four or five times. Um, it's one, one bedroom and two bedroom apartments and no bachelors. Uh, there's underground parking and outside parking. Uh, common issues are heating, pest, and safety uh, due to the neighborhood and the surroundings. Um, this this building also faced evictions, and that's what we are talking about today. Uh, so, in terms of eviction stats, I could say in my building, uh, about 25% received in for notices uh, during COVID at different stages. Um, mostly because they were unable to pay rent in full, uh, late payments, loss of income, and Thankfully, no one was evicted, and all eviction notices were resolved without enforcement. Um, the great efforts, efforts from Acon Canada to educate and organize, and uh, community legal uh, clinics uh, and uh, Toronto tenants, uh, which is FMTA, uh, provide the help needed uh, to uh, to support the tenants to face this uh, this uh, uh, this uh, eviction notices. Uh, Trend Bank uh, from the city of Toronto did uh, provide some relief um, to those uh, tenants who were behind on rent. And obviously, um, all this happened together and tenants were able to form a tenant association that uh, me being one of the members in it. Uh, it was found in February 2021. And mainly, we targeted uh, uh, the building issues that, that were never addressed. Uh, there were several issues. Uh, we, we, were in, uh, we were in uh, this, um, emergency home stay home orders, but uh, we had problems with heating, uh, lack of heating, uh, lack of ventilation uh, for floor tiles for coming off, uh, closets falling down. So it, it is not a, it's, it's not a uh, safe place to stay home. So the, we, fact, uh, we uh, uh, put together a great, uh, great organizing effort and that uh, change uh, not only halted uh, um, multiple evictions in the pandemic, uh, but also um, uh, real, I mean, made, uh, made landlord realize the importance of uh, healthy homes. Uh, and that is work in the progress. A lot of the works are already done, but this is, uh, there's more work done. And uh, as of now, uh, we are hoping there will be no AGIs or renovations in our building, but if it's supposed to come or if it's supposed to come, we are prepared to respond. Um, and moving on to the employment stat, stats in, in our building, about 85% of the 85% uh, are frontline workers, live with family. Uh, most of them are grocery workers, factory workers, nurses, drivers, cleaners, um, uh, security guards. Uh, most had a second job or part time job or cash, cash job to supplement their already expensive uh, uh, rental market. So 25% lost employment and uh, obviously changed jobs due to COVID um, in, in, our, in our building. Um, all of them, all of them actually earned less during COVID than previous years. So now we have to look at it. So the tenants, we have less, but we have more fight to go through. Increased increased um, increased uh, house calls are depending on employment insurance, social assistance, and child support, and and most of them are depend on public transit. Uh, or, or most of the tenants here depend on public transit and shop at local businesses. So, who's really hurt by the pandemic? Are the people, the people low income people who are in the low income, who are renters, um, or tenants, uh, are other victims of this COVID, and. We have not looked at who are their pandemic profiters. I mean, I believe uh, we did, but it's just that it's not being widely discussed because they have a then they have a responsibility, and they then we have to and they have to respond. So that's why it's not being uh, 
publicized or discussed about. So, so what do, what do tenants need and what is the right solution? So it would be like small businesses, tenants need a relief. This, this pandemic, nobody anticipated it and nobody was prepared for it. Um, and it's not the responsibility of the tenants. It, tenants should not carry the burden of this COVID. It is supposed to be uh, the corporations. It's supposed to be uh, the people with the means who can uh, who can uh, uh, who can uh, take the take the loss. But unfortunately, that's not what's happening. It's all all the weight is put on the on the tenants uh, who are already at the bottom. So landlords and uh, landlords are not negotiating with tenants because their position is already uh, they they have a powerful position. Uh, and tenant do not have any power to negotiate. So when we have a bill like uh, 184 that says, oh, uh, tenants and the landlords can work together, that's a joke. Uh, you're just, uh, you're expecting a tenant who's going to lose home, uh, who, who, who have the home to lose, expect to negotiate with the landlord who has the power to say, take it or leave it. So it, it just, uh, the system we have right now is, uh, it's just extremely disgraceful uh, to a democratic country. Uh, this is not supposed to be, uh, and this is not supposed to be this way. Um, so to further on, uh, till today, um, the government only provided lip service and uh, there's no real solution. Politicians are living in parliament bubbles, uh, not in reality. That's why they are not comprehending or they don't want to face it or they don't want to talk about it. Uh, inequality has in, in, is increased to an unsustain, unsustainable level, um, and it, it's just it's just not sustainable anymore. Um, I think uh, my Rob uh, colleague uh, uh, Rob really explained well on what would happen if this continues. Uh, help these uh, these tenants who are helpless are forming uh, tenant unions, and for example, in my building, um, we never had an association, and uh, now we have one. Uh, so it, it helps uh, tenants feel uh, somewhat uh, uh, safe and somewhat they have they are protected but because they because they have at least they have the access to ask for help or directions or what what to do and how to respond to the uh, info notices eviction notices how to respond to how to make a landlord um, do the repairs um, uh, even though they were negligenting. It's, it's, um, it's sad, they used the COVID as a strategy to not to do repairs they're supposed to be doing in the first place. Um, but people were getting uh, eviction notices and uh, rent increases. So uh, what are the solutions we have now? Uh, what are the solutions currently we have? Are pretty much temporary financial reliefs uh, without no permanent um, recovery measures. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, it's, it's a lip service to frontline workers and then claw back the benefits. It's um, they're just disgraceful, uh, and uh, I, I don't know how it, it's, it, it, any politician with some credibility can stand up and say um, we are going to provide premium for frontline workers, uh, and then in the end, what happened is the opposite, um, and it's a very few who actually got it. So. In what we see more, more, and more, and more in this, uh, in this, uh, in, uh, in this capitalist climate, is uh, corporate bailouts, and that actually benefits stakeholders and CEO executives only. It doesn't really benefit the people, um, and and uh, there's more and more push for vaccines. What vaccine is not the solution to the problem, yeah, and it does not prevent future crisis. Um, good we need it it's an immediate solution but it is not a whole solution to the the underlying problem that we have so these these solutions need to be addressed uh, at as a policy level at at uh, with the, with the good governance um, corporate job creations are illusions because they are created to get government grants in the first place then they, a lot of the jobs don't ex exist after three to six months so they're gone so the, we, 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 are, we are knowingly living in an illusion or fake society, not a, not a real society. And that is what the capitalism is trying to convince people that we have, a, we have a government, we have, uh, we have rules and regulations in place, but indeed that is not, not favoring the most, it's actually favoring the few who are on the top. So, uh, and so what are the remedies? Okay, so we discuss the problem, so we can look at these remedies. Growing, in, the growing inequality does not help the social harmony. So we need 
policies and, and governance that actually reduces the inequality. And that is, it is an emergency. And obviously millions in offshore reserves do not help our economy. It's just, uh, it's going to sit there, it's going to help uh, the few. Uh, so the for profit corporations does not care about people so they're not going to come up with uh, come up with uh, uh, measures to help uh, frontline workers it's, it's it's the government that has to put in policies uh, so that corporations can comply with even uh, there's uh, very little compliance uh, anyways that's other other issue that we have uh, faced with so elected officials need to end that toxic affairs with ceos it's just um i don't have to mention names but uh, uh, these these elected officials are in constant communication with CEOs, not with the people. Uh, I personally wrote emails and never received a response for three months. So uh, it's it is it is uh, disgraceful. Um, so the frontline workers are exhausted and un understaffed and ignored, and they need to be they need to be properly. Um, the resources need to be put in place where it needed the most. So wealthy do not obviously wealthy do not eat or shop at small businesses. So they. Uh, it's it's a it's a people so we we need to invest in people and social programs that is what is going to help the economy so if you do really care about the economy that's what we need to do so i'll just uh, um finish up uh my uh, my uh, thoughts with uh, these few few uh statements it's like covid is not a problem it exposed the existing problem problem pandemic premium for frontline workers is a perfect example and tenants should not be forming unions in pandemic times to protect their homes in a democratic society but it's happening across the country. It's an evidence that people cannot depend on the government they elected. Housing is a human right. It should not be for profit commodity. It is not a profit commodity. Government needs to build housing for people instead of profit. And that is the solution. And government at all levels need to reevaluate the priorities. Government is to serve people, not capitalism. But that is what's happening uh, one after other for so many years. This is what's going on and the inequality. The, the providing lip service to get votes and then bringing policies to support big corporations is what happened all throughout the years. And I think pandemic just exposed it a bit more so easy to see. No one benefits by keeping essential workers poor and oppressed except for the capitalists. Uh, we need bold revolutionary government, not a status quo, do not want to upset the rich style leadership. Lastly, the Pandemic has revealed all layers. Importantly, the answer to what is a good governance is. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Okay, so now we're going to, with the help of our technical producer, Kurt Young, we'll take some questions from our online audience. We will take three questions at a time and then call on our panelists to answer none, one or all three, it's up to them. Uh, Kurt, it's over to you. Okay, our first question comes from Barry, who asks, does the history of the 1930s rent strike show that tenants need a workers' government that will expropriate big landlords and build affordable housing on a grand scale? Elizabeth asks, is it enough to rein in the REITs, a real estate investment trust, that is to end tax breaks for giant corporations that buy up big rental properties? And Demand Better asked, do we need a public investment bank for housing, climate, and cooperatives? It's ridiculous that the PPP Canadian Infrastructure Bank exists instead of a public one that could print unlimited investment. Okay, so the three questions are in the chat column. You can read them. You each have up to five minutes to answer which question you'd like. And the lineup will be Marianne, Kerry, Eurydice and Rob. Marianne, up to five minutes, five and five minutes sharp. Okay, and that's just one question. I a question of my choice, right? Whichever you want, one, yep. two, or three. So okay. Cute. So Elizabeth, I'll take your REITs, the rain and the REITs thing. Like this is uh, it's you know, I don't understand uh, you know, there was you know, Jim Flaherty, when he was finance minister, not any left wing progressive loony by any description or measure, uh, saw that a bunch of companies were trying to convert into uh, income trusts. It was going to lead into what, you know, I always love it, the term tax leakage. Uh, you know, there was a big fear of that. So they basically, you know, put in rules to 
you know, prevent this, you know, conversion of regular publicly traded companies, regular stock companies to uh, income trust, except did not apply it to real estate. Uh, it just, you know, it, it, so anyway, so, it was, you know, these real properties were it, 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 it exempted from this change. And I don't understand it now. I think it was 2007 when those changes came in. And I think when it occurred, I think it was called sort of the nightmare on Bay Street. But it did, like, you know, they got over it. They're still profitable. They're making money. The whole business model is, you know, like with a regular company that trades shares, you pay dividends, but those are done, you know, periodically. They're not done on a monthly basis. And with real estate investment trust, the whole purpose is to keep shoveling money to people month after month. They don't pay corporate tax if they meet certain holding requirements. You know, they don't exceed a foreign cap. So they just get this sweetheart tax deal. And maybe that would make sense if they were using some of those mass, massive profits to create affordable housing, but they're taking affordable housing, making it unaffordable and you know shifting costs to tenants through above guideline rent increases and other things and it just seems ridiculous and it should stop so you know should other taxes you know may you know should we look at other progressive tax system for other corporations yeah maybe there's a threshold when you're making you know a certain amount and i'm kind of pleasantly surprised by Tobo tobias lutke at shopify that you know shopify quietly became you know, the largest capitalized, you know, the company with the largest market cap in Canada ahead of Royal Bank by, to some degree, being the anti-Amazon and helping out small businesses and helping them go online during COVID. So maybe there is a bit of capitalism with a heart. There's not too much of it. You know, there is a group in the U.S. called the Patriotic Millionaires. We need you know, more of that patriotism and this idea that, you know, paying taxes isn't a sucker's game. It's the price we pay to live in a civilized society. And in fact, you know, in Japan, I thought I remember reading once that they actually publish a list of the people who pay the highest tax. And it's an honor to be on that list. In North America, it'd be called the suckers list that you were too stupid or, you know, to not be able to access the right help to bring your taxes down. So I think there needs to be a mind shift and absolutely go after the REITs. They're first in the line, but progressive taxes overall, much better. There shouldn't be, when Warren Buffett's talking about how it's you know ridiculous that he pays a lower tax rate than his secretary, here's a guy who knows a bit about finance. That's it. So I'm wrapped up. Thank you, Mariana. Okay, our next speaker is Kiri. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Um, I will actually uh, uh, pick, uh, respond to the similar tone with, uh, with uh, my colleague Ellen uh, Mariana for that same question. Is it enough to rein in the rates, uh, uh, that is to end tax breaks for GM corporations that buy up uh, big rental properties? Um, no, it's uh, the tax break should not happen in the first place. And what, what it is, in my opinion, um, is they like Mariana well pointed out um, they are taking the affordable housing and they are making it unaffordable so that that is what uh, the rain in the rates are um, it, it is happening so uh, th that is why Acon put up a, a great campaign uh, to to show that these these tax breaks do not actually help the cost but it hurt the cost so what is the real solution uh, to the housing is to build a more housing, affordable housing. And that's a, another uh, campaign that ACON is actually focused is to uh, push for 20 to 30 percent, um, 30 percent of, of any new new, new new housings to allocate to affordable housing. And that's where that we need to focus on uh, rather than giving tax breaks, uh, these uh, corporations who are already misusing it. And it, it, it's an it's a ongoing evidence of how cooperation operates in a capitalist um, um, climate. They will continue to uh, prioritize uh, profit at the cost of uh, people, and it it is it is again very disgraceful, and it shouldn't be that way. Um, there are some of the poorest countries in the world offer free education and have affordable housing, 
Um, but it's so disgraceful that in North America that that we are wealthy enough, but we don't have affordable housing for people, uh, and uh, we don't have adequate affordable housing for people, and uh, our education is very expensive, and we we still uh, we still have uh, phone lines and internet lines that we pay higher price compared to uh, uh, the other developer countries. It's it's again it's uh, the system is com completely set up to set up to keep the working uh, poor and oppressed and that is that is why uh, this this movement of uh, movement to uh, toward the uh, better better government governance and and radical radicalized uh, radical way to uh, look at government policies is is getting uh, more attention is because uh, the the current system is rigged and Oh, they you know they have all the tools. The corporations have the tools, uh, luxury, and the, and the and the and the resources to exploit any government policies. So we need a government that come up with strong policies that actually dedicates and protect tenants and protect the working class and protect uh, the vulnerable population. People who are already in vulnerable position don't have the power to stand up and um, uh, defend their rights. And that's what's happening right now through these evictions. So it's just people are set up to fail, and then when they, uh, when they, um, when they are up against a big corporation, they and they and lose, and they're told, um, well, uh, they did not uh, live up to their expectations. So it it is unfair, and it, like um, Mariana said, it's maybe in another way to it's one way is to name and shame, um, but that's not enough. As no as uh, Canadians, uh, we cannot champion on the human rights outside the border, but inside we torture our own people, and that it shouldn't be that way. And we we have to focus on how we treat our people uh, in in a in a in a day to day basis, in a, uh, in, a, in a in a policy wise. And uh, we we need to bring those changes, and we need better governance. And we cannot have this status quo leadership any longer. It's just. It, this is the status quo leadership is continue to produce these kind of laws uh, that really puts people at the difficult at uh, at disadvantaged disadvantaged positions. Thank you. You're muted, Elizabeth. I'm sorry, folks. I'm not muting myself. I don't know what's happening, but maybe it is a glitch in my system. I'm not touching my mouse. Nothing is happening here. Sorry about that. Uh, so anyway, but just keep in mind to our panelists, of course, you only need to answer one question if you wish, but we do have three and, and you're welcome to take on all three as long as you can do it within the five minutes. Our next speaker is Eurydice. Okay, so uh, I, will, um, I will start with... Uh with various question. Um, I think, um, you know, everybody is in a point in their lives. I have lived quite a lot. And for me, it is very evident that uh, the situation uh, of tenants and landlords and the situation uh, of the world in, in general will not be solved. And I'm talking as Myself, I'm not talking for the Federation here. Uh, I, I'm not supposed to say what the Federation thinks because the Federation is, a, is not a person. But uh, uh, I think that we live in a world that is greed-based. The capitalist system is a system based in greed. In the greed of a few, that hoard everything to themselves and uh, will use the others as much as as much as they uh, as as it is um, useful uh, is uh, gives them advantage. So definitely, uh, not only uh, expropriate big landlords and build and build affordable housing, but having. Uh, public transportation, having public education, not like in Canada that our kids have to pay to go to school, to go to university. You know, having, having all of that, uh, the capitalist system is not answer to our needs and certainly will not answer the needs of tenants. And I'm talking to you here because you have an advanced kind of public. 
because when I when I talk as the tenant organizer in in the buildings I go, uh, I I can I have to start from a much lower level. I can tell people, look at what your politicians are doing. Look if your politicians are taking up your cause, because I still go to buildings where tenants will say things like this to me. Oh, I miss Major Ford, Mayor Ford, because he would come and blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like people, people really, uh, and, that's, and that's it. We need education. We need to get together. We need to, to grow, <laughs> like to, to grow this, this level of consciousness so people understand that in this system, in the system of, uh, of greed and of necropolitics where we want people, more people to die so the rich are richer and just the ones that are useful to work stay, this is not the system where you want to live. So this is one question. I don't know if I talked my five minutes. Uh, I'd like to to take the the other question, the last question. Uh, does we do we need a, a public investment bank for housing, climate, and cooperatives? Uh, definitely, definitely. Uh, we we have very little in terms of supports uh, for tenants or for anybody to have to have a place to live. And, uh, you know, the banks should exist to support us and not to suck everything out of us. So I am not an specialist in economics. I will, I will leave it here because somebody may elaborate better than I, but this is, uh, this is what I have to say. Okay, thank you, Ridisi. Uh Rob? Great. Okay, so I'm going to take a crack at Barry's question about the 1930s rent strikes. Does it show that tenants need a workers' government that will expropriate big landlords and build affordable housing on a grand scale? Well, the answer to that question is yes, but it can be hard to draw that conclusion directly. It's not a simple conclusion to reach. Because remember, the, the mass evictions during the Great Depression were averted through reforms within capitalism. The problem with reforms is that they always go away uh, over time. So during the Great Depression, we built the welfare state out of nothing. Um, and that was great. It fixed a lot of stuff. But now the welfare state uh, since the 1970s has been under sustained attack under neoliberalism, under neoliberalism. So this really is the classic dilemma, reform or revolution. Uh, this is the, the dilemma that's been going on since like 1914. Um, so I want to talk about the differences between the ACORN and the socialist action programs. The, the socialist action program is revolutionary nationalize the big landlords and establish a housing construction industry publicly owned and under workers and tenants control to create good quality public housing for all who need it. The ACORN program is reformist. They stand for healthy homes, inclusionary zoning, vacancy control, and landlord licensing. I'm not going to explain each of those things in detail. Suffice it to say that if all those reforms were to be implemented, implemented property, we would get affordable housing. It would work. So let's just say, for example, we did the ACORN reforms and got affordable housing. That would be great. But the thing is, you didn't actually get rid of capitalism. You fix one market, the capitalists will find an another way in. They'll either attack the reforms that you put in and, and ruin the housing market again, or let's say we completely fix the housing market and enshrine it in the constitution or something like that, what they will do is they will shift to another market. They'll start messing around with the food or the grocery stores or the vehicles or something that we need. They'll inflate it to the point where they're doing their profiteering through that and we still are gonna end up suffering. So at the end of the day, the answer to Barry's question is yes. Uh, we need a workers' government that will expropriate big landlords and build affordable housing on a grand scale along with getting capitalism out of all the other markets. It's really hard to do, but eventually we will have to do it. And I'm gonna take uh, a crack at that uh, question about uh, the public investment bank. Uh, my economic knowledge is probably uh, less than Eurydice's, uh, but I, can, I like the idea and where you're going with it. I can just think of one weakness that would come up. 
uh, printing unlimited investment or printing unlimited money within capitalism uh, might bring a hyperinflation, which may, uh, well, which would become a problem. Uh, so that's, that's going to be my answer. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we're going to go back to Kurt, our producer, for the next three questions. Kurt? Um, Elizabeth, um, we have uh, uh, input from a longtime uh, viewer uh, named Rory Jones uh, discussed mm -hmm. it. Uh, he has, uh, he's facing a potential uh, case for eviction and he'd like to uh, us to read out his uh, his response or his uh, his statement that he will be uh, using to uh, in his fight against this eviction. Uh, and he wishes for us to speak it out, out on air. Would that be all right? Yes, go ahead. Okay. So I'm going to uh, switch the camera over to myself as I'm reading this out. Okay, so this was May, uh, written May 25th, 2021 to Tribunals Ontario from Roy Hunter Jones, Tenant, uh, I will not give his address, Brantford, Ontario. Okay. Concerning the upcoming video hearing on June 1st, 2021 at 1 p.m., I intend to oppose the application from Stephen Morris and landlord to evict me from my apartment due to rent arrears from the, for the following reasons. One, I have tried numerous times to pay the rent by check and the landlord indicated he will not take a check, just cash only. Two, cash and his handwritten receipt is not safe due to a number of reasons such as transmission of coronavirus, loss of receipts, and therefore no record in his claim made last year that the receipt I showed him was fake. Cut and paste, a check cashed through my bank provides me with proof of paying rent. Three, he has indicated he would ex uh, accept the certified check only. I will provide certified checks if he agrees to pay for the cost of certifying the check, the cost being the bank's charges and my cost to get to the bank. I have a medical condition which prevents me from driving and my bank is located downtown Brantford. Four, I am working and I and can pay rent plus rent owed on a fair and regular basis. In summary, I have tried to pay rent. He refuses to accept payment. Therefore, he should not be allowed to use rent arrears as a basis for eviction. He tried the same thing a few years ago and did not succeed. I paid all the rent owing on a regular basis and was not evicted. Roach Hunter Jones. Okay. Thank, thank you, Kurt. Okay. So I will uh, be asking uh, three more questions. Uh, just let me switch back to Elizabeth. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. And thank you, uh, Roy, for sending that in to us. Okay. So the first question comes from Justin Ranke. Uh, what does an effective and comprehensive affordable housing strategy look like? Uh, John, John McNamee uh, asked, in my brief time volunteering with local homeless population in New Brunswick, it was, a, it was mind boggling how many were just unlucky with a single layoff or injuries. It's incredibly hard to bounce back without luck. Abby C asked, I read an article claiming inclusive zoning policies could solve the affordable housing crisis. Is this a, a valid solution or does that primarily benefit developers? Okay, so you have once again up to five minutes and you please like before stay within that five minutes for time wise and our lineup will be Eurydice, Rob, Mary Ann and Kerry. Eurydice? Okay, so um, I will start with, uh, with this statement from John uh, McNamee. Uh, his, who says that in his brief time volunteering, he found how how easy it is to fall through the cracks. And that's exactly what it is, you know. Uh, we, most of us live, it's, it's, it's sad everywhere. Both, most of us live about two paychecks for homelessness. Like you lose your job, if you if you're not if you don't have a lot of reserves or a great network, you are homeless. Uh, another thing is in times of COVID, before COVID, you lost your job, you lost your apartment, you, you were evicted. Somebody has to mute. Uh, you were you were evicted. You would like surf coach like uh, coach surfing. 
expression. In, in some, in, with friends, you stay here, you, you'd stay there. Uh, it is it is now impossible. In times of COVID, nobody is going to give you a sofa. So you go to the park, and when you go to the park, you get the police on, on your... So, yeah, it is very easy to fall through the cracks, and not just for the poor. Like, people like to say, when I came to Canada, people said, oh, who live in the street are mental health uh, uh, impaired people. Yes, some of them live, unfortunately, but there's many other people that live in the street for all kinds of reasons, you know. So um, that's my, my answer for this question. And then I'll go to, to Abby, see, um, uh, she says uh, that in, inclusive zoning policies could solve the affordable housing crisis is a valid solution or does that, that permanently benefit the de developers? Well, uh, I would say that uh, uh, inclusive zoning policies as part of, an, of a, a strategy in the system we live is a good thing. Is that a solution per se? No, it is not. Alone, it's not a solution. You need much more than just inclusive housing policies. You need more than to end the not in my backyard stuff. You need more to uh, not do the not on my condo not poor people living in my condo. You need more than that. And then I'll go finish my, my mix that question with the one of Justin, that is what does an effective and comprehensive affordable housing strategy looks like? I, uh, I'm not a policy maker. I'm just a tenant organizer, humble one. But uh, uh, I think that is a series of things, uh, including massive uh, expropriating or construction by government. Giving money to developers is not the solution. It is not the solution. Those guys get high subsidies to, to give, to, to, to put some poor people, some poor people in their buildings. They get rich with it and people keep being poor People after a few years, they are evicted. I know seniors that got in, in one of those buildings that uh, uh, 20 years ago, they got in one of those buildings with a subsidy. And now 20 years passed and the subsidy has expired. And now they are 80 years old and they have to pay more and where they're gonna get this money. So uh, this is what I have to say, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Eurydice. Rob? So what does an effective and comprehensive affordable housing strategy look like? Well, let me explain in detail now how the ACORN program uh, would likely be implemented. So the three big ones are healthy homes, inclusionary zoning, and vacancy control. So healthy homes is pretty straightforward. You cannot force people to live in bed bugs, cockroaches, and, and plumbing that doesn't work. Uh, inclusion, inclusionary zoning is a little bit more tricky. Uh, it means that for any new development, uh, there has to be a certain amount of housing uh, that is defined as affordable. And with that one, the devil's in the details. And that, that actually leads into Abby's question, which I'm going to answer next. Uh, but it just means that you have to have some affordable housing in new developments that are built. And the last part is vacancy control. Uh, again, uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, you, the landlords can't jack the rent every time they flip a tenant. So they have no uh, incentive to get people out of units uh, to increase uh, the rents. That's how the ACORN uh, affordable housing strategy would look. And I think it would be quite effective. It would probably fix the housing crisis or, or put a big, big dent in it. But then there would be all the problems of uh, the capitalists would do other things. So now let's look at some of the uh, revolutionary solutions. Uh, mass construction by a publicly owned company. Well, they did this in Venezuela. Uh, I think they're probably up to something like 3 million units of high quality publicly built uh, housing in Venezuela now. Uh, these units are available to basically anyone. You, you don't have to be special to get in them. They're good places to live. How did they do it? Uh, I don't know 
like right down to every nut and bolt how they did it. But I think what they did was they uh, seized the a lot of uh, things like raw materials uh, and factories to make stuff like timber and lumber and, and nuts and bolts and all the rest of it. Uh, and uh, then they uh, just used public funds uh, from the public uh, gas money uh, that they sell in Venezuela to get workers to build all this housing and then just make it available to the public. Uh, so that worked out quite well. And then the final way, uh, uh, the final comprehensive affordable housing strategy, the extremely revolutionary one, uh, this one's really hard, but it would be really fast and really fix the job, uh, would be the expropriation of the existing vacant or unused or underused property. So the empty houses and the, the, the empty units, uh, we, we just take them and we put people in them. Maybe we compensate the people who own the property. Maybe we don't. That will be decided in the revolution. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Marianne. Anna. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. So, um, yes, I will go to uh, John McNamee's question first. I mean, I, um, you know, I think part of the conversation is this isn't just a housing issue. It's a uh, good jobs issue or lack of good jobs issue. Uh, there's more precarious, along with rising house, you know, housing costs, there's been a rise in precarious work, there's less stable work, I, you know, my father came to Canada, you know, he was born in Ukraine, uh, he, you know, he was able to buy a property, uh, you know, and have a middle class life with three, you know, raising three kids on a blue collar salary. That tends not to happen anymore, uh, you know. So that is part of the issue: is that we're losing. You know, there's too many people on contracts. There's too many people in gig economy. There's too many people self-employed that it's not their first choice. So part of that is there. But yes, I did lose a job after 22 years in 2007, and there were times where I thought, "Am I ever going to get a decent job or a career again?" So that's part of it: is we need to. You know this globalization has you know drained a lot of good jobs from canada and that's part of the issue so the um the inclusive zoning policies yes it's a good idea if they're going to build it anyways and they're going to get concessions on height or other things to build it that's important to have that you know to, to recognize that if it's going to go ahead anyways let's get a cut of that that's not going to resolve the whole issue on its own because they're you know the developers will always convince um the politicians that they they can't you know they're, they're they'll try to get the lowest threshold possible and spin numbers to do that and it's going to be a challenge but you know you look at places i think vienna's got a very high proportion of uh social or affordable housing maybe look at some of the other models uh in the world there and then the um comprehensive affordable housing strategy. It's got to be a lot of tools. I, I know it sounds like you maybe have some uh, viewers outside or listeners from outside of Toronto, but one of the things is the missing middle. Like in Toronto, about 70% of land in Toronto is only designated for single family homes. So that's why you see the McMansions is they can't, they couldn't put a duplex, they couldn't put a triplex in it if they wanted to. Uh, because the zoning rules don't allow that. So there has to be more ability that when units are built, there is a secondary legal safe unit in it uh, and just opening up that missing middle of the 70%, although neighbors will flip out because, oh, the character of the neighborhood, if it gets opened up, because tenants were always seen as second-class citizens, you know, the, the challenge is, you know, penetrating that thing. But yes, inclusionary zoning, some sort of financing, three levels of government getting back into the affordable housing issue and uh, affordable housing. And we need a return of good jobs. The, the vacancy tax, the speculation tax in BC has been helpful. And I don't know, maybe we name it even an inheritance tax and some of that inheritance tax when property is transferred, uh, you know, goes, goes into affordable housing. So those are kind of my thoughts. Um, and uh, but yeah, big, big questions and great questions. Thank you, Mariana. Kerry? Uh, uh, yes, uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so uh, I will try to answer the, the questions uh, in, uh, uh, in a 
in in again a one call uh, one call uh, set um they do uh, actually i do appreciate the questions of uh, justin uh, and abby uh, as well as john uh, the statement of uh, how unlucky their circumstances could be for one but it's not really an unlucky situation now it's actually an unlucky for a lot of people uh, yeah, uh because of the covid and it's actually we wouldn't um, it's it's kind of systematically created this unluck unluckiness. It's a systematically created uh, this uh, uh, this uh, debit, uh, this uh, uh, this condition. So uh, yes, it is it is it used to be unlucky earlier, but now it's 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 intentional. Intentional how uh, the the poor should be poor, working uh, working uh, oppressed should be oppressed. It's very intentional. It's obvious now, uh, and I, I do appreciate that statement. And uh, moving to Justin, uh, what does an effective uh, and comprehensive affordable housing strategy look like? I think Rock really uh, hit their uh, home run on that. Um, it it, ha it shouldn't be one side solution or one last one way. It, it should be, uh, um, you know, from a mul mul diverse uh, perspective. For for example, like uh, taking uh, to, to, like immediately seizing all the um, all the vacant uh, vacant uh, uh, units and. Uh, and putting people in it. For example, in my building, is about 135 uh, families living in it, and it's approximately 145 uh, units available. So we have about 10 units, uh, eight to 10 units are vacant throughout the year, and it shouldn't be that way. And why do we have that 10 units uh, um, uh, is sitting and just nobody's using it? And those those units should be captured, and that could be. Uh, that could be implemented right away. We don't have to wait for new, uh, new development because these are things existing resources, untapped resources we already have that could be benefited. So this this vacancy decontrol is one of one of the uh, one of the Aikens campaign is to is to get all these uh, uh, these vacant places and uh, put people on it. And one other one of the strategy was to add tax on it. But even the tax that uh, we were, uh, that currently we have is which is coming next year uh, after uh, after a long uh, campaign for, uh, by Econ. It's only one percent uh, tax uh, for um, uh, for vacant vacant units, and that's a joke because that's not enough. Because uh, developers would rather pay the one person and keep the keep the unit empty. So when the when the prices go up, they'll rent it. So they they already rigged the system. We we are just uh, activists and advocates. Uh, we are just uh, in a significant uphill battle, and we are really behind. And it's it really bothers us uh, us uh, to see this. And it just that's why we are each and every day we are. Um, uh, we are uh, we are doing what we can do in um uh, going to uh uh going to abby's uh, questions about uh, climbing inclusive zoning yes again the puzzle um it it will, it will really help uh, even the 20 to 30 percent which Acon is campaigning for is not enough. It's based on current stats, and we're assuming if that was to be accomplished within the next five to ten years, that's not enough. That should be that should be uh, factoring with the population increases. We should be even pushing for up to 40 percent. Should have uh, about 40 percent um, units should be affordable homes uh, in order for to avoid to uh, to solve this housing crisis, and that those collective efforts will uh, will resolve the problem uh, in in, a, in in our current climate but is capitalism willing to do that no because they are profiting from people they are profit of they are profiting of people's misery and they are profiting of uh, homelessness and they are profiting of everything you can think of and that's why we need the good governance and the governance that is going to be implementing uh, public infrastructure, investing in public uh, public uh, system, uh, public uh, housing. Um, so th these are the priorities we need to go on. Uh, uh, even the, right now we see what happened in the long term uh, long term care homes. It's it's devastating, and uh, we don't know when the when the when the uh, investigation is going to start, and we know we don't know when that's going to end. But regardless of what the result is, is it going to do any good to us? I don't think so. We we need to we need to we need to right away start acting acting on our principles and bring the change that we want to see in our community. Um, thank you. Okay. Thank you.
week, panel and panelists, we're going to take our last two questions. We only have time for two more uh, because we're already running over time. So, Kurt? Are you there, Kurt? Sorry, I double clicked on the, the mute button. So, okay. so Barry asks, is housing a right or a privilege? As long as housing is a commodity, the higher education elective surgery, like higher education elective surgery and expensive medical drugs, the working class will be exploited and denied human rights. It's a solution to ha the housing crisis, ec economic or political. Uh, demand better has could we have a co-op construction companies build co-op housing with loans from credit unions buildings parallel uh, building parallel economic power and helping solve housing crisis the housing crisis okay panelists so we only have three minutes each for these questions unfortunately and the lineup will be curry eurydice mariana and rob curry no thank you um Yes, actually, to answer uh, the various question, is housing a uh, how, is housing a right or privilege? Uh, as long as uh, housing is a uh, commodity, um, it will become ex ex continue to exploit it and deny human rights. Um, it's a solution to uh, housing is economic or political. Uh, it's both actually, uh, because po politics is is what's going to uh, set the policies in place, and economics is what's going to what's going to be the outcome of those policies or, you know, or changing the direction. So um, it, it is, it is, it is a, mainly it's pol politics, then it's economics, but however, it's both interconnected. Um, it, it, first of all, we need to acknowledge that housing is a human right. And th that is, that is, uh, an, uh, it, it is, it is sad that it is, an, uh, it is not being acknowledged that way, because if it's acknowledged, it's, um, as a human right, then they will the government will be forced to act on it. Uh, for example, these mass evictions in the COVID pandemic time, while they stay home orders in place, it's um, it is disgraceful, and uh, it's I'm 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 really shocked that we are not uh, taking serious stand on this because we are not holding police um, the the people in the elected people accountable because what they're saying and what they're doing are two different things. Like my like my colleague Mariana mentioned. April 2020, uh, our premier stands and says, if you cannot afford to pay rent, you do not have to. And while he, after while he's saying it and, and after whatever uh, statements follow up he mentioned, the, the eviction factory is working. Eviction factory actually hired more people to evict. And um, uh, when I say eviction factories, I am uh, referring to a landlord tenant board. Uh, they're evicting people, even though knowing the, the the majority of the majority of the applications are made made in bad faith because they know the circumstances that the tenants are facing, but still they are applying it. Landlords are applying it anyways, so they can they have only beneficial they 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 going to benefit from it because if the if the if the uh, tenant leaves they're going to they're going to rent uh, rent it higher to someone else. So it's just um it's just uh, um and unfortunate and um, and uh, to just to touch on the last part um it's do we need a, 30 do seconds we, uh do we need a housing uh, housing uh co-op housing uh yes that would be a good alternative like like we mentioned earlier um it's it's a it's a collaborative effort it's uh, we cannot have one one uh, one side uh fit uh, one side to resolve all the or meet all the aspects or all the issues it's just it's again it's one of the one of the avenues we can take to resolve the housing crisis currently we are facing thank you thank you you ready to see sorry so um housing it's definitely a right. It's a human right. Uh, the government of Canada said so. 
<laughs> if I weren't saying that, and if Perry weren't asking for that, and all of you weren't saying that, the government of Canada says that housing is a human right. So uh, we all should be housed properly in a country that is rich like ours. So how, like, housing cannot be a commodity, higher education cannot be a, uh, <laughs> like education cannot be a commodity. So uh, the solution to, to the housing crisis, uh, I think is, is primarily political because it is, it is, the, it is the political will that will, that will help define the economy. Unfortunately, we live in a society that is economy driven. But, uh, but that is not a good thing. It should be driven by the, by the politics expressed in the will of our citizens, of our human beings. Uh, and the other question is, um, uh, co-op construction companies build co-op housing with loans from credit unions. Uh, uh, I am not sure. Um, I'm not sure. What we have of co-op in Canada presently uh, is not a great model. Uh, working in the tenant hotline as I did in the past, I got many, there's, there's many, there's many complicated things in the co-op world. world uh, world. So I think that, uh, again, in this system, there's many ways of, uh, of uh, having people taking advantage of things. Uh, so uh, I really, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if, uh, if building a parallel economic power uh, can, can help. No, I think that what can help the housing crisis is the government taking charge of it? It is building. It is uh, like things Bob said. It's vacancy uh, control. It is top above guideline increases. It is uh, proper, decent, clean places for people that can help. You know, that would do wonders. Thank you, Ridisi, Mariana. Thank you, Elizabeth. So I had to go and Google the Maslow's hierarchy of needs because, yes, at the bottom of it is uh, air, water, food, shelter, sleep, clothing, reproduction. So uh, I guess it's interesting because, you know, yes, there's a declaration of housing as a human right. But I guess the problem is when you have rights without any viable recourse, that's the issue is like it's fine to say somebody has a right to something uh but if that right is not um who enforces that right and that's a challenge if somebody doesn't have you know shelter who goes to jail who is accountable who pays the price and that's the problem of uh, you know the if, of saying it's right and much as anything else ontario human rights code protects people against discrimination by disability, gender, a lot of other things. But, you know, how, what ability do people have to actually enforce that right if that right is violated? So that becomes a bit of the issue is that I think, you know, maybe the easiest thing to say is that we can all agree it's a human need. We should all agree it should not be a commodity. And that's the biggest problem right, right now is it's treated as there's this been commodification of accommodation. So it's not treated as a need. It, it's in some cases it becomes a luxury because you can only afford to get decent housing sometimes if you have, you know, a higher than middle class pay. So that's the sad part of it. So yes, should it be a human right? Yes. Uh, do we have a mechanism in place to enforce that right right now? No. So maybe we should just start stop the whole charade of pretending it's a human right and make sure that there is the mechanism to enforce a basic human need before we take it to the second level and call it a right. So the um, the co-ops too, like, I mean, I have know people who live in co-ops, they have a good time. I agree with Eurydice, it may not be the, the, the best model. I think it's sometimes dysfunctional. There's challenges financing. The, you know, the basic thing too, is that the co-ops are competing with other, um, you know, 
private for-profit developers for land and everything, that creates a challenge. So maybe there's a middle ground to be found there that certainly I've gone to housing forums where they say we need to do more of this. It's a challenge because they're competing with private market um, developers. Thank you, Mariana. Rob? Is housing a right or a privilege? Well, uh, my great panelists already answered that question. So I'm gonna just spin it forward and have a little bit of a, a John Lennon moment here and imagine. Imagine housing really was a human right and we want it as a human right in a socialist society. How would housing be organized in socialism? Well, it would be guaranteed for, for one thing, uh, bad housing with cockroaches and all the rest of it would be a thing of the past. Uh, and the guaranteed housing would be coupled with full employment you would have a job. You could never be unemployed. You would probably work less than 20 hours a week and the job would be uh, specified to you. It would be a job that you would like. So that's how housing uh, as a human right would work in socialism. And it sounds like it's gonna be perfect, but there would be problems. Uh, new problems would come up. For example, what would we do about the people who just don't feel like going to work? Um, and then um, is the solution to the housing crisis economic or political? The answer to that is both. Uh, it's an economic, problem. But whenever we engage in economic struggles, every time we realize very quickly that they take on a political character. So we can always win the economic reforms and they always go down after we win them. The way to end this endless back and forth game of trying to pay rent, avoid eviction, avoid poverty, jail, and all the rest of it is to have that political struggle. And that, my friends, is the final struggle to put the working class in power and end this nightmare game once and for all. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I know we don't have much time left, but I saw this in the chat, and it's only in our chat. I don't know if, if, if the listeners have it. Eurydice, could you please read it? It's your poem. All right. Okay. It's a poem I wrote. It's very Toronto. The Rich. I am fascinated by the wealth of the rich. It's big houses and gardens with flowers manicured by women and men who come from afar. The streets of the rich have pickup trucks and vans in teams of gardeners who speak other languages other than the one spoken by the rich. The rich speak very well pronounced English and carefully wear color up polo shirts. And the rich, the rich women in fancy attire jog to eliminate fat excesses from the fine foods prepared by cooks with an accent or brought in by a dark skinned Uber motorcycle. I am enchanted by the immense trees that close with their tops, the sky from the streets of the rich and the care that the city devotes to the neighborhood, as well as the absence of sidewalks, which have the dual purpose, to extend the beautiful gardens over the roads and uninvite to the path, the foreign feet of the knowledge. The rich are grateful to health workers at Sunnybrook Hospital. This they make clear with small posters decorated with drawings of flowers and hearts on the lawn of their houses. Thank you, frontline workers, says the message. It is that the children of the rich study medicine at the University of Toronto and the daughters of the poor work at the supermarket checkout on the front line that nobody sees. Thank you very much, Eurydice. It's a beautiful, beautiful poem. Okay, so thanks to everybody. Thanks to Rob, Mariana, Eurydice, Curry, and of course, Kurt, our producer. And please consider folks being a supporter of Socialist Action Newspaper, which we will send to you online. To fill out the form, just visit our website at www.socialistaction.ca. And if you would like to talk to us about joining uh, SA, write to socialistactioncanada at gmail.com, or of course, just give us a call at 647-986-1917.
Once again, if you like the show, please subscribe to the Socialist Action YouTube channel. Our next webcast will be on a Saturday, not Thursday, but Saturday, June the 5th, starting at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Why? Because it's going to be a conference. That is the occasion for Socialism 2021. How to Make a Revolution, an international education conference. It will be on from 1 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, there will be three sessions. There will be breaks between each se section, of course. And it will feature presentations and discussions on the following topics. Is there a parliamentary path to socialism? With John Clark, Tom Baker, and Florencia Shade. The revolutionary potential of the working class with Gary Porter, Julius Arscott, Yazen Kaya, and Sandra Griffith Bonaparte. And the Leninist Party on the left with Barry Wiseletter, SA Canada, and Jeff Mackler, SA USA, and Aimee Gonzalez of the Socialist Unity League in Mexico. So please, mark Saturday, June the 5th in your calendar now. In the meantime, listeners and panelists, be safe, stay healthy, stay active. Bye.